Did you know that most doctors' first jobs in the U.S. are actually assigned to them by a computer algorithm? To become a doctor, you need to attend four years of college and then four years of medical school. After that, you apply to residency programs at hospitals, which is an additional three to seven years of your life. Applying to med schools is done in a normal way. Basically, you send in your applications directly to the school, and they come back a few months later with an acceptance or a rejection. But applying to residency programs is a bit different. Instead of applying directly to hospitals, medical students create a rank list of the hospitals that they like, and they send it to a central agency called the National Resident Matching Program, or the NRMP for short. The NRMP is the one that matches students to hospitals. Each student creates a ranked list of the hospitals, and each hospital also ranks the students from most preferred to least preferred. Then this central agency collects all of these rankings, and then runs an algorithm that matches students to hospitals. Once it's done, it gives everyone their assignments. Now, this algorithm was a huge deal in economics. Lloyd Shapley and Alvin Roth, two of the inventors of this algorithm, actually won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2012. There was a third creator as well, David Gale, but he unfortunately passed away in 2008, so he couldn't win the prize. This algorithm has a huge impact on society. In 2023. 42,952 medical students voluntarily participated in NRMP in order to be assigned to a residency program. It almost seems like this is some communist social planning, and feels dystopian that people are willing to have their future careers be decided by some computer algorithm. But without it, the free market was even worse. NRMP was created back in 1952. So before that, students applied to hospitals directly, and it was a huge dumpster fire. In the U.S., medical school is typically four years, and graduation usually occurs around May of your fourth year. Imagine this is before the NRMP existed, so people applied to jobs directly back then. In the few months before graduation, you have a flood of students entering the job market. But the really talented students tend to find jobs pretty quickly. So if you're a hospital and you want to hire the best, you need to act pretty fast. Let's say there are three graduating students, and among them, Joey is your top choice, and you have one opening. A month before graduation, you give Joey an offer, but you don't know if Joey even likes your hospital or the likelihood that he'll accept your offer. Now Joey doesn't actually like your hospital, and by the time Joey rejects you, the other two students have accepted other jobs, so now there's no one to hire. So to avoid this, you want to be earlier than other hospitals, so you decide to give Joey an offer two months before graduation. Then, if Joey rejects you, you may still have time to send an offer to your second choice. Hospitals all started to send out offers earlier and earlier. In the 1900s, offers would be sent out shortly before graduation, but by the 1930s, offers would be sent out half a year before, and by the 1940s, some offers would be sent out when some students were still in their second year. Everyone realized that this was a huge issue. So in 1945. Medical schools unanimously decided to withhold student information until right before graduation. This forces hospitals to make offers close to a student's graduation. But hospitals retaliated with their own strategy, exploding offers. Basically, they gave students very tight deadlines on offers. In 1945, hospitals gave out offers with a deadline of 10 days, which is reasonable. But only a few years later, in 1949, deadlines were around 12 hours, which is completely unreasonable. By 1952, hospitals, schools, and students were all completely fed up with this situation, 
that they decided to abandon the free market and created their savior, the National Resident Matching Program, or the NRMP, which still matches students to hospitals to this day. Because no one seems capable of making a match on their own, the decision-making process is offloaded to this algorithm. From each student, the algorithm needs a ranking over the hospitals from most preferred to least preferred. Each hospital needs to provide a ranking over the students as well. In addition, hospitals also need to tell the algorithm how many openings it's trying to hire for. Then, the algorithm takes this information and tries to simulate what would have happened if there were no deadlines for offers. In this case, hospitals would send offers to their most preferred candidates since they don't have to worry about students running out of time and accepting another offer. The yellow and pink hospitals would both send an offer to their top choice, which is the brown person. And since the red hospital has two openings, it would send out offers to its top two choices. As a student, if you have a bunch of offers, you would only consider your favorite and reject the rest. So this brown student would reject the pink hospital because it's ranked lower than the yellow hospital. Then the students are temporarily assigned to the best offer that they have currently. So currently, the pink hospital and the purple student aren't matched. Now the pink hospital will send an offer to the next person on its list which is the green student. Now, the green student has two offers, but he still prefers the red hospital, so he rejects the pink hospital. Finally, the pink hospital goes down his list once again and sends an offer to the purple student. Now, the purple student has an offer, so he's matched with the pink hospital. And now everyone is matched and the algorithm stops. This algorithm is literally simulating the actual process of hospitals sending out offers and students making decisions. In real life, the main problem was that students ran out of time and had to respond to other offers before he could see all of his potential offers. And this algorithm is able to avoid that problem. This is one of many scenarios where a free market fails and some kind of central planning is actually beneficial. This algorithm we just saw is called the Gale Shapley algorithm, named after its two creators. But sometimes it's also called the Deferred Acceptance algorithm. You might be wondering, after NRMP gives everyone their assignments, why do people need to obey their match? What if someone says, I don't want to? If people don't have to obey their assignments, then this whole algorithm is kind of pointless. Fortunately, it turns out that this will never happen. This is because there's no reason for people to disobey their assignments. This blue guy is matched to his top choice, so of course, he's going to stick to his assignment. Now, this green guy is matched to his second choice, but his first choice doesn't prefer him over its match, so there's nothing he can do. Similarly, the brown and purple guys are matched to their second choices, but there's also nothing they can do about it. This is because each student is already assigned to their favorite hospital out of all of the offers they received. So any hospital they prefer more couldn't have given them an offer. Likewise, the first two hospitals are already matched to their favorite students. And the third hospital, if you remember, was rejected by his first two choices. So he's kind of stuck with his third choice. So there's no reason for anyone to veer from their assignments. This is called a stable matching. A stable matching is usually a good goal to have in matching problems with rational agents, like this one. Now, here is a matching that's not stable. Here, the blue person and the red hospital both prefer each other over their assignments. And this pair also prefers each other. So if this matching happened in real life, there's nothing preventing this person from calling up the hospital he prefers and break their NRMP assignments. And in fact, people do do this in real life when matchings are not stable. So stability is a good property to have, and the Gale Shapley algorithm always produces a stable matching. But the stable matching is not unique, and historically, 
there were concerns that the algorithm was giving biased matchings against students. In our example before, this was the stable matching we had. But it's not the only stable matching. Here's another stable matching. And you can see that this matching is also stable because the first three students all got their top choice, so they should never switch. The last student got his second choice, but his first choice, the red hospital, likes him the least, so he also can't switch and this matching is stable. But although both matchings are stable, it seems like this matching is somehow better for the students since three people got their top choice and only one person got his second choice. But if we look at the initial matching again, only the first person got his first choice, while the other three got their second choice. If we look at this table, for these students, matching two is better than matching one. And for everyone else, they're matched to the same person in both matchings. So overall, for students, matching two is better than matching one. But the situation is reversed for hospitals. For the red and yellow hospitals, the first matching is better than the second matching, and the purple hospital has the same match in both. So for hospitals, matching one is better than matching two. It turns out that in the Gale Shapley algorithm, whoever sends out the offers always gets the better matching. When we first looked at this algorithm, we had the hospital send out the offers and the students evaluate the offers. Then the final matching we got was the best stable matching for hospitals and the worst one for students. But it doesn't have to be this way. We can also have students send offers to hospitals and hospitals evaluate offers. This slight modification leads to the best stable matching for students and the worst one for hospitals. From 1952 to 1998, the NRNP used the hospital proposing version of the Gale Shapley algorithm. This means it was biased against students and in favor of hospitals. By the 1990s, medical students got better at math and realized that the matching algorithm NRNP was using was hospital proposing, so it was biased against students. But they had other complaints as well. There was one concern that people might lie about their preferences in order to get a better match. This could happen, although it's pretty rare. Imagine just for fun, we're in a different setting this time. This is a dating market with three men and women. Alice here is most into Fred, with George as second and Harry at the bottom, and these are the other girls' preferences. On the men's side, Fred likes Bonnie more than Alice, but the other two guys both like Alice the most. So in this situation, George and Harry would both send Alice an offer, and Alice would match with George. Fred would send an offer to Bonnie. And then Harry would send an offer to Carol, so ultimately, Alice would be matched to George, which is her second choice. But now consider what happens if Alice lied about her preferences and pretended to like Harry more than George. Then, when the offers come, Alice would match with Harry instead of George. Then, George is going to propose to Bonnie, who's going to unmatch with Fred. Fred would then propose to Alice, and Harry ends up matching with Carol. So, by lying, Alice ends up with her soulmate, Fred. The lesson here is that lying is good, and dating is quite complicated. In real life, Lying about your preferences is hard to pull off, but this was a concern at the time. A bigger complaint at the time is that this algorithm couldn't handle couples very well. This was kind of a unique problem where you might have a couple who want to live in the same city together. So when an RMP robot comes along and tells you to go to different cities, most people are going to say no and won't follow through with their assignments, which kind of defeats the whole purpose. The solution was to have the couples submit joint preferences. For example, the top choice could be for both people to go to the same green hospital. And then the second choice is for the blue person to go to the red hospital and the other person to go to the yellow hospital. If either person gets rejected, for example, if the blue person gets rejected from the red hospital, 
then the pink person also gets rejected, and both have to move down their preference list. This is a way to handle couples, but the downside is that stable matchings may not even exist anymore. Nevertheless, to deal with these complaints, Alvin Roth, who we saw before and who won the Nobel Prize, was asked to redesign the algorithm. The main change was to let couples submit joint preferences. Although stable matchings may not exist in this case, this is very rare in practice. In addition, they moved to a student proposing algorithm, which means students get the best stable match they can get. And for the second complaint, they found that it doesn't really happen much in practice. So overall, this redesign algorithm is currently being used by the NRMP, and I think this is a very cool algorithm that also has a huge impact on people's lives. There are also other interesting problems that Roth worked on, like kidney exchange, which saves thousands of lives every year. I'm going to talk about this in my next video. Please subscribe if you like this video. I'm a very small channel, so it helps me out greatly. See you next time.